All right, everybody, this is going to be a very special episode. We have uh, we have never had a guest from Ukraine, and so I'm super excited. Welcome, Ala, to the Flower Podcast. Hi, Scott. I'm very happy to meet you in person. Well, it's um, when Erin shared about your seed before all of the other stuff that she's doing with you came out. I saw it and I jumped right on that. And I'm excited to say that uh, I got a copy of your book and it's amazing. It really is an amazing book. Thank um, you. And I'm excited to say that I ordered a bunch of seed that I know they're on my on the way to me now because I'm tracking them and I can't wait to get them. Um, and so we're going to get into all that today. But I, you know, always like to start at the beginning and uh, just wanted to know, how did you find your love of gardening? Where did it start? Oh, it started um, back in my childhood. I do not know why, but I adored flowers, uh, um, I think, from my birth. And my parents, they always told me that it was impossible to take me away from the flowers. As soon as I see the flowers, I was there. So I was trying to make a bouquet. I was trying to... Uh, cut some flowers. I was standing near the flowers. I do not know why, but I just adore them since my childhood. And I was always very, very interested about the names of the flowers. Uh, I was interested in every single grass I can see. So I would like to know how it is called and uh, how it grows. And everything was very, very interesting for me. And when I was a very small girl, I think I attended school already. We had relatives living not far from us. And uh, we came to visit them. It was spring, early spring. And for the first time in my life, I saw snowdrops, real uh, white snowdrops. Uh, and before, actually, people here usually call our regular Scylla Sibirica. It's a common and widespread flower in spring here. Usually they call it snowdrop because it's the first flower and usually the first flowers of uh, some region, peculiar region, they're called snowdrops by the locals. And when I saw that white flowers and I asked the name of the flowers and learned that they were real snowdrops, um, I was just Fascinated. So I wanted them immediately in my garden and my relatives, so they digged me a <laughs> clump of snowdrops and they are growing in my garden since that time. So they increase and actually my aim was to spread them all over the garden because when I see uh, gardens in England, I see that they have just lots of white snowdrops and it looks as if uh, their spring gardens are covered with snow and I wanted the same effect to my uh, garden too so I'm trying to propagate them as quickly as possible I usually replant them and I have more and more white snowdrops so this love is from my childhood I do not know why but it seems that I was born with the love of flowers and it all started with snowdrops <laughs> uh, right. yes yeah, yes, snowdrops were gardening. among the first flowers, which really fascinated me, and I just adore them. Sure, I you know, and it's crazy. I don't think it's only it's only been maybe the last three years. I didn't realize how many varieties of snowdrops there are. I mean, it's crazy how many there are. I was shocked by the number of the varieties because, um, actually, when I got access to the internet. And uh, uh, at that time, forums were extremely popular, and I registered on the uh, Scottish Rock Garden Society forum, and they grew lots of snowdrops, and they seemed just fantastic. I never saw before <laughs> such varieties. They were green, they were yellow marked, they were double flowered. So it's just unimaginable for me. And I'm still very, very surprised at the number of varieties at the moment. How many, how many varieties do you have now? 
as for the snowdrops, not many, unfortunately. Okay. Maybe 20 varieties or maybe 25, 30, something like that, because um, they are very expensive to buy. And usually uh, when I had an opportunity to swap with other gardeners, sure. I used it. So I do not have many, but I just love all of them. They're magnificent. <laughs> I have several double varieties, uh, which are not expensive, but um, they're double and they're really beautiful. I have uh, even a yellow marked variety in my garden, and I'm very happy that I managed to plant it in my garden. I just feel lucky about these. So snowdrops is my biggest love, one of the biggest love. I think sure. number two after clematis. <laughs> Of course. Well, that's still a lot of varieties, way more than I have for sure. And uh, that's amazing. And I didn't even know there were doubles. That's, I mean, I, I really, I guess growing up in uh, the Southern United States, we didn't see a lot of snowdrops, or at least I didn't see a lot. And unlike other flowers like that. And so, um, I don't know, it's, it's really fascinating. Now you, um, you primarily garden for pleasure for your photography and then and then how long and now you're selling seed so i'm curious um how did that evolve because you um if if you know from uh what i know I, you grow on two places or two gardens two lots Yes, that's right, because we have two plots. My uh, most important plot is at my granny's place, and the second one is at my mother-in-law's. And uh, as for the seeds, it all started like I'm gardening for a very, very long period of time, because I think I started when I was around 23 years old, I think, and now I'm 38 and uh, I'm still gardening. So it's a quite a long period of time. And as for the seeds, I think that I sell them for quite a long time, maybe six or seven years. But wow. uh, actually why I decided to do it, because I had many, many requests from other gardeners and from other plant collectors. And as I have um, quite rare clematis in my collection and also species pennies, which are mostly propagated by seeds, they always asked me for seeds first um like um i rejected these uh but then um i saw the seeds uh, at my garden uh, one time then another time then one more time and they grew very very well and i decided why not help people and um, um my intention was to help other gardeners who love specific and rare plants uh, to propagate them to have an opportunity to grow them in their gardens and I created a small catalog, and actually, uh, first it was uh, just a Word document, which contained a list of varieties, and um, it was intended for a small number of people uh, really interested in growing seeds. But then uh, it started to widen from year to year, because more and more people wanted to buy seeds. And uh, uh, this trend to grow from seeds is becoming actually more and more popular. So people enjoy growing from seeds because it's the next stage of your gardening experience. So you start trying the simplest plants, then you want to grow something more exquisite, maybe more difficult, then something even more difficult. And then you... Um, Came up, you come up to the decision to try to grow from seeds because it may be more challenging, but the result um, will be more rewarding too. As um, um, the um, plants which you grow, first of all, from seeds, you will grow lots of plants at one moment. So it won't be just one plant. You will got like a bunch of them, depends on the number of seeds. And it's very, very uh, good because rare plants, they are expensive. And buying, for example, a division of peony may be very, very expensive. While propagating from seeds is much more affordable. And you get numerous plants. And they will be beautiful sometimes. Like I uh, sell open pollinated plants mostly. And uh, they can be 
variable to some extent and uh, sometimes you get um plants which will be even exceeding the characteristic feature of its parents for example i have already my own clematis seedlings which i really like and peony seedlings and they are prominent uh, i study their characteristics so i look after them for several years to be sure that they will be flowering stably that they will be abundant in flowering and that the coloration for example the form of the flower they will be stable too and i have some seedlings which are very very interesting and uh actually in future possibly they will become the new varieties so this process is just extremely challenging interesting rewarding and that is why people like to sow seeds more and more and the catalog started to widen yeah you have a lot of items on your catalog um and i know i was i can't even remember some of the things i i purchased i think there was a a, a shrub of some kind and there was a, some lilies i got uh and some different things so i'm super excited about that i didn't realize um how many varieties of peonies that you have that are um species peonies is that right and when you sow those from seed do they pretty much come true from seed like because, uh, you know, you have some close together. Do they cross easily or are you able to keep them far enough apart to, to protect what you're doing? Uh, well, they are growing in various parts of the garden. But, of course, you can't exclude these opportunities that they could be crossed by the bees because sure. it's natural and uh it depends so some plants they may be similar to the mother plants some plants can be variable in form or coloration so it may depend uh and as i have a very big collection i think that uh i have at least 50 pennies and uh if we speak about clematis it comes up to 100 i think so i have quite many of them and not all of them are on the catalog because for example i have some varieties um small creeping variety ilva and not every year it gives seeds so i do not know uh, what influence this small plant but sometimes there are lots of seeds it's okay sometimes there are less seeds or possibly no seeds so not all the uh, varieties are on the catalog which i actually have and yes the choice is very big but of course the number of the seeds is uneven so some varieties they give much more seeds while other varieties just few seeds so it depends on the variety yeah uh, but of course it's great to have such a choice especially the first uh customers they are always very lucky because they have this wide widest choice and this is great sure yes um i felt i felt pretty fortunate at the time i um okay so let's let's dig a little deeper into clematis if we could i um you know i come at it from a cut flower point of view because a lot of what i deal with is is cut flowers and so some of our audience they're designers uh well a lot of our audience are designers and then the other big chunk is all flower farmers and so you know, we're interested in learning about this as a potential cut because we know that there's a lot of varieties out there that are being cut. But when I see so many of these varieties that I'm sure have never been used for that, um, I, I, I just would like to start with, you know, what I, this is a very generic beginning. Um, is there a lot of variation within all these species of clematis like do they all like the same conditions and where where could we start and just kind of basically talking about um how to grow them uh oh conditions uh, as for the uh, cut flowers i see your point very well and by the way i started to conduct an experiment because i'm interested in this topic as well i adore arrangements i'm not a professional i'm not a florist but as soon as the growing season starts here i usually uh, make arrangements just uh, to have them in my house uh, practically every time that i 
come to the garden because I adore fresh flowers and why not make an arrangement if you have them in your garden and actually yes. it may be even very beneficial for the plants. For example, when you cut uh, down galantus flowers, snowdrop flowers, uh, they propagate better especially at the initial stage when uh, they are not uh, um, actually they are in buds and you just cut them and they may be propagating even uh, better so i just adore this and i started an experiment um i was uh, cutting down uh, various clematis and trying them uh, and uh, uh, trying them in my arrangements in order to uh, decide uh, on their vase life mm -hmm. And this is quite interesting. Um, some of them are really, really good as cut flower varieties. Well, actually, there are some commercial varieties grown commercially as cut flowers. Sure. It's diversifolia group, as far as I know, because they have uh, straightforward stems and they can grow uh, quite um, long stems. Uh, so they are ideal as cut flowers. Uh, but from uh, my experiment, I also learned that bell-shaped clematis are quite good as cut flowers. Most of them are quite good. They are called actually in the United States leather flowers uh, because they have very thick petals and uh, um, they have quite a big vase life. So I just enjoy adding them to my arrangements and they have that unique look. So they add a touch of elegance and yes. exquisite to the arrangement. So I just adore using them. Uh, while um, some varieties, for example, viticellas, are not good as cut flowers at all. For example, Clematis tensile, it's very beautiful uh, and amazing viticella, but it, it, fade away, uh, it fades away just immediately. So you cut down it and it doesn't last in the race at all. So um, the same is about Clematis recta. Somet sometimes I need like small flowers um, for my arrangement, small and delicate, but it also doesn't last long. So I continue my experiment. So I can't say that I have already studied every variety in this way, but I continue doing this to have this information. Um, and uh, also what I personally adore it's using seed heads clematis seed yes. heads in that's just magnificent because they last very long and usually when they start drying out they became very fluffy and they look just great in any condition whether they're green or whether they're dried out and fluffy so just gorgeous i adore them and i use them very very often as cut flowers uh, and when we speak about growing clematis, uh, definitely they have various conditions because uh, the genus is very, very big. It includes lots of species from various regions of our planet and the conditions, they really differ. For example, uh, clematis atrogenem, um, they are very special clematis because they are flowering very, very early in spring. This is group one pruning, so you do not need to uh, cut them down for winter. They are winter very well because they come from colder regions of the planet. And they start flowering, I think, from the middle or end of April here. Uh, and this is the reason why I adore them. And um, their conditions differ because they have a very different root system. Uh, it's very superficial, it's not deep into the ground, and as a result, they prefer places which are shaded. They need more moisture, because as the root system doesn't go deep to the ground, they are unable to absorb water from the uh, deeper layers of the ground, and they need more watering when uh, heat comes here. Um, also, if we speak about patterns group by the way I have very uh, I have lots of messages saying that people are very unsuccessful in growing clematis and I understand um, at the very moment when I read the message that uh, they talk about group two clematis this is large flowered group most hybrids are based on clematis patterns which comes from uh, Japan 
originally and they have a very different climate very different climate which is much more milder and um, uh, as for my garden I also write that if I plant group 2 clematis I also have problems and I may be unsuccessful but that's not because uh, you can't grow those clematis just the climate is very different and uh, this group actually is very tender and they do not like our climate conditions and that's it so they start um, suffering from wilt and no matter what you do, they continue suffering with wilt every year. And from year to year, uh, the bush becomes thinner. And uh, finally, like you have to renew it. It's absolutely OK. They just grow that way. But they are very easy to propagate because when you dig uh, the um, vine into the ground, uh, it gives new roots and this way you can like make your clematis bush bigger and with more stems and actually it's one of the ways um trying to keep it in the garden because like you, you're producing new plants all the time which actually keep that bush living thriving and flowering in your garden so it's absolutely okay and i usually recommend growing group three clematis they are small flowers, but I would say that this characteristic is very, very relative because um, the flowers differ. Um, if we talk about, uh, for example, bell-shaped flowers, uh, yes, they are really small. But if we talk about viticellas or some other species, so they are quite decent in size, I would say. Not that B has grew too, but the flowers are absolutely okay. And you have just uh, a sea of flowers. So they compensate maybe this flower size uh, with the abundancy which they produce every year. So they look just great in the garden and very unusual because some clematis unusual to the extent that people usually asks, uh, ask what it is, and they can't believe this is a clematis. Right. If we speak about clematis heracleifolia, which are bushy species, and they look very, very different. If we speak about creeping variety, which I have, it also looks very, very different, and you can't believe it's a clematis. So uh, it's a very, very good choice. Uh, and as for conditions, for example, if your summer is very, very hot, so it's very good to plant out bell-shaped clematis because they're just great in such weather. They have thick petals and they have very long roots penetrating very deep into the ground, so they do not need much water. They do not need watering all the time. And um, the heat is very beneficial for uh, their flowers because if the weather is very, very rainy, from time to time we have such summers and you have just rain almost every day, uh, those thick petals start to rot. So they do not like wet weather. And if your weather conditions are more wet, are not that hot, then uh, spring flowering at Regana would be perfect. Milder climate means that large flowered clematis may grow well as well. Um, and also we have very, very special clematis, uh, which adore very dry and very hot conditions. For example, I had such clematis Mongolian gold, which is growing from the southern side of the house, which is an extremely hot place. But this clematis just adores these conditions. Mm. And I tried to uh, plant like <laughs> a part of this clematis in um, another place but it didn't want to grow there it also likes hot conditions in summer so yes they are quite variable mm. that's crazy I, I didn't realize there are some that thrive in the heat that group too that you're talking about that's a little more delicate um is it more the the heat or the uh, the dryness of the summer that is the problem for it or is it also the cold i never know you know, because sometimes I know that, you know, it can get too cold for some varieties. 
Well, I think it's a complex of factors because they do not like heat. That's definitely. Even their flowers do not like heat. And uh, when it is too cold, uh, like very, very frosty in winter, mm -hmm. uh, then they have to be covered actually in um, severe climates. And if you do not do that, uh, their wines may uh, die. They are beaten by frost and then they won't flower. But um, the, uh, uh, this climatis, they will uh, give other wines, but the flowering, for example, won't be double because double flowers are produced only on the last year's wines. And uh, when you have oh. stems, they won't be double. They will flower, but with single flowers. Okay, I didn't know that. That's interesting. Um, with, are you hybridizing some varieties also, or are you? I mean, with that many varieties, are you trying to create new ones? Uh, this is my aim uh, for now. Uh, I'm sowing my own seeds, uh, but uh, those seeds um, weren't produced um, artificially by me. So I just gather what I have, I saw, and then I have seedlings and I have to watch them attentively uh, in order to fix the main characteristics and whether they are stable. I uh, usually to choose the most interesting ones from the bunch which I have, so I have to wait for the flower and then I decide which are the most interesting ones. Uh, but my aim is also to make um, artificial uh, crossings uh, but it's my aim, I think maybe after the war we'll be able to do it because uh, like it's very, very difficult. So you need more time. Uh, you need to um, write the program of your hybridization. So what plants you are intending to cross in order to receive um, characteristics, a number sure. of characteristics. So you, you have to uh, prepare this plan. In order to do that, uh, I have to study more literature because I'm not a professional hybridizer, so I lack some knowledge. But it's not a big problem because you can find um, all the necessary information right now, so it's not a problem at all. Um, otherwise, it's very, very interesting, actually. And then you have to spend time like hybridizing your plants, so it's very, very, I would say, um, that's much work and much efforts, but this is my aim. Sure. So for now, for now, I'm growing what I have. So I'm sowing the seeds I have, and it's already very, very interesting. But the next level is artificial hybridization. And so I hope that soon I will proceed to this level. Well, it's exciting to think about because you have so many varieties and honestly when i've seen photographs of some of them i'm i'm like wow i didn't even know some of these existed i know that um i see offered on sometimes the dutch auction a lot of times on the japanese auction um the bell-shaped clematis that you were talking about and uh, they're, they're not inexpensive. And that's one reason why I was excited to buy some seed for them because I was like, you know, I want to try playing with them and growing them. Uh, when you're growing from seed, um, you're right. I love the idea that you can get many plants. Um, and I think that's great. How long does it typically take? And I know it may depend on the variety, but from seed to flower how is that like years is that you know how long does that normally take oh clematis are very beneficial flowers in this aspect because uh the time of expectation for the first flower isn't too long very often they flower uh, the next year so uh, this year you have the seedling mm -hmm. it starts growing and the next year you may have already a flower but of course it depends on the species for sure. example what is integrifolia they are very very speedy so they uh, grew and flower quite quick while other flower other species may be slower but still it's not a very very long time so it's not like five years or seven years uh, like other <laughs> cultures 
for example, lilacs, magnolias. I know that hybridizers are working on so many plants, and um, I just can't imagine how much efforts, how much time, and how much waiting. <laughs> I know. I mean, because you think about some of these varieties that may take years and it's like you don't know if you got a successful cross uh, for years. Meanwhile, you're continuing to create more. And uh, and then and then, of course, then you might, you know, strike gold and have that one variety that you you create. That's amazing. Um, well, that's good to know. I was concerned that sometimes it may take a few years, um, but I know it does depend on the variety. Uh, and I also was wondering when you look at the varieties, and again, I'm thinking from a cup, a cup perspective, um, varieties that produce those amazing seed heads, like for cutting and that texture and things like what varieties tend to really produce more of those than others? Uh, well, first of all, I would name Clematis songarica sundance. It has just amazing seed heads. They are gorgeous. So first of all, it has lots of them, a sea of flowers and then a sea of uh, seed heads, which look just great. And they look great in the arrangements. I adore this variety. It's just magnificent. Clematis songarica sundance, amazing. Very abundant, very simple to grow, and very, very good performer. Uh, also, I adore seed heads of Clematis integrifolia. Uh, the reason is they are produced quite quickly. They are quite mm. quickly for flowering, so they start flowering in June. And already in July, you can see the first seed heads, and you can use them in your arrangements. For example, I use them with flocks. Because in July, um, there are not that many um, flowers flowering, actually, because it's quite hot here. But flocks are flowering, bell-shaped clematis are flowering, and you've got those first seed heads. Um, and also, um, I use the seed heads of some bell-shaped varieties because um, they are quite harmonious. For example, clematis viorna. Clematis glaucophila, their seed heads are lovely too. Oh, wow. I, I, you know, that's funny. When you see these little flowers, you th just think, what do the seed heads look like? I don't even know. Uh, you just, you know, you think, are they, are they bigger? Do they have as many seed, even though the flowers are small? Uh, by the way, uh, the seed heads, they look very, very different on the Clematis varieties. And uh, most often when we speak about clematis, we imagine those uh, ball-shaped seed right. heads, they're ball-shaped. But uh, if, for example, we have clematis recta, clematis heracleifolia, the seed heads are very, very different. Clematis stands, and um, they usually have one seed produced or several seeds produced from a flower and uh, usually you do not have many seeds of such varieties so they look very 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 different but uh, atrogen, clematis integrifolia, uh, group two clematis, uh, most group three clematis um, they have quite similar those ball shaped uh, seed heads they're most common sure <laughs> now uh, yeah and don't also, there are clematis um, that do not uh, yield seeds. For example, I have a very beautiful hybrid. Um, on uh, It is based on clematis heracleifolia, Mrs. Robert Bryden, uh, but it doesn't produce any seed at all. So every year I'm looking attentively, but I do not see the seeds. So it is a sterile hybrid as far as I understand. And uh, my customers are always asking me because in, the, in autumn it looks like a big blue cloud. So it's covered with uh, those uh, small flowers. They are blue. It's in September usually. And in September you got this blue cloud in your garden. It looks charming. And also it attracts uh, butterflies. So usually it has lots of butterflies and it, it, it all looks great. But unfortunately, it doesn't yield any seeds at all. So I have nothing to offer. That's sad. What variety is that again? 
Uh, Mrs. Robert Bryden. Okay. But it's well, fantastic. Yeah, I, the idea of a blue cloud just sounds fabulous in a garden, especially that time of year. Uh, so at what stage do you harvest the seed? Because I'm curious, like, how long do they need to really, how long does it take for them to mature once they kind of present themselves? Uh, it's very easy to determine. Uh, first of all, uh, they turn brownish, beige or brownish. And uh, when you try to uh, take them by your hand, they are easily taken. Mm. So as soon as they're easily taken by your hand, they are ready to harvest. Uh, also, uh, they mature in a different time because uh, clematis flower in different time. They produce uh, seed heads in different time and they get mature in different time too. So I have to collect them gradually. And also some seeds, they uh, do not very often, the seeds do not mature simultaneously. So you have to gather every variety multiple times, which is not actually very convenient. It takes lots of time, but you have to gather them gradually because if you do not do it, you can lose your seeds because those seed heads which uh, have already matured, they can be blown with the wind and that's sure. it. You have to do it gradually starting from the end of the summer and actually till I think December because um, the varieties which are flowering late in autumn, so which are flowering in September, they take time in order to get ripe and usually I guess as I'm in the end of November. So. Sure. Well, let me ask, uh, I'm kind of curious more about your area that you're growing in. Um, I'm not familiar with what zones or area, you know, I haven't, I haven't looked at the map to kind of figure that out and elevation plays a part of that too. So like when is your average first frost and when is your average um, last frost? Uh, we are living in zone four. It's actually considered to wow. be zone four. But uh, the thing is that um, I think for the last uh, maybe even 10 years, the winters are very, very different from what they used to be in my childhood. I remember very well that when I was a small child, the winters were very, very severe here. And uh, we could have minus 25 degrees Celsius. It's very, very cold. I understand that America- uh, It's okay. In Fahrenheit, but uh, it's very difficult for me like to make the transition quickly. It's fine. Uh, so minus 25 uh, degrees Celsius, it's very, very cold. And we usually had just lots of snow, lots, lots of snow. And now the winters are very, very different. It's like minus 15. It's very, very cold already considered to be here. And we have less snow cover. So winters became milder. Um, well, I think due to the um, global trend. Uh, and... Uh, um, now I can say that uh, we mostly um, look like zone five, I would say. Hmm. Well, I noticed so, and on social media, you were showing your snowdrops blooming already. Um, uh, uh -huh, no, but that, uh, these are autumn flowering. Oh, okay. See, <laughs> I'm learning more about snowdrops than I ever thought. That's so funny. Um, yeah. I I never knew that they existed, but when I saw, I understood that um, I have to have autumn flowering snowdrops, and they're <laughs> very specific. They're very specific because they're coming from uh, more southern regions, from Greece, for example. And uh, um, I planted them uh, in the. Um, I have a plot. Uh, it's the southern part of my house. It's a very hot plot because um, it is sunny all day long. And also the house gets um, gets some heat during the day, mm -hmm. and uh, it makes the spot even hotter actually. And um, I planted out them on this spot, and they're growing very well because they do not need uh, lots of moisture in summer. And on this plot, the moisture is very scarce and they receive the necessary heat during summer months and they start flowering. But of course, it may depend 
Uh, as for uh, your question about the first frosts, uh, sometimes we may have the first frosts in the second half of September, but it's mm. very, very early. It's considered to be very early here. Usually, first frosts come in October, and uh, they come in the first half of October. Uh, for example, this year, I think uh, we had it very, very early. It's around 15th of October which is really early too. And um, then we have, uh, usually we have a period which is frostless and it may be even sunny, but most beautiful plants are already killed by the first frost. Right. And very, very sad usually. <laughs> and as for the last frost, usually it's in April. So if the last frost were in March, so it's just happiness. So you are lucky, but very often you may have the return frost in April. And if the garden starts uh, to uh, grow fast, some plants may be damaged by those return frosts. Right. And it's really a problem because, for example, I have a very good collection of ephemediums and uh, um, they are killed by the frost, by the return frost very often. So you should cover them if the focus shows those frosts. Uh, so my climate zone is in between four or five. And very often customers ask most of them uh, in the United States, they have zone five. And I always write that the clematis from my catalog will grow just extremely well in your garden because uh, zone four is um, has much more severe conditions, while zone five is really optimal for them because I do not cover them in zone four, actually, but in zone five, that will be just great. Yeah, well, I'm a little warmer than that, so but I uh, I'm still excited to try and I. Uh... I'm, I'm just glad. I, I was wondering when you, with all the different varieties of climate, clematis that you have, um, when it comes to fertilizing them or bugs huh. and things, um, are they very different or do they all, I, I mean, I, there's so many you have, I'm curious how that may vary. Ah, if we speak about species clematis, actually they do not need to be fertilized at all. And this is a very, very good thing because wow. I have a big collection of species peonies and species clematis and they do not need to be fertilized. And this is the feature which I just adore and enjoy <laughs> a lot. Uh, the most important aspect is to have them mulched because uh, mulching is very beneficial for their root system. And also when you have a thick layer of mulch, it starts to rot and uh, it gives all those nutrients which it contains to the plants. And this is enough for them because this is the way how they grow in wild nature. So they do not need some artificial fertilizers. Um, but um, I also have garden varieties, so uh, when I have a possibility, I usually use some commercial fertilizers, so you can just choose the fertilizers for clematis. There are lots of specialized uh, fertilizers or just a universal fertilizer. My favorite way is to add it to, um, uh, to the solution. For example, if you have... Um, uh, if you uh, conduct some works in your garden, uh, for example, um, intended to combat some um, diseases, climatic diseases, so you can mix uh, those, uh, um, those uh, um, how to say, it, those substances like fertilizer and uh, uh, the uh, means which you use to combat the diseases of climatis. And you just spray it all over the garden because uh, if the fertilizer is universal, it will be okay for your roses, it will be okay for your mm. peonies and for all other plants. So I just usually do not bother too much about that. And I'm using just some regular and universal fertilizers, which will feed the majority of the plants in my garden. But if you stick to the natural garden and if you stick to the species plants, so you do not need actually fertilizers at all. 
So what do you oh. use for mulch primarily? Is it just leaves like, you know, in your garden? Yes, I usually spray the plants. I usually spray the plants. And uh, as for the roots, I just have a thick layer of mulch. And it's a very, very important condition. It's also a fertilizer in some kind. Sure, but like what I'm what I'm wondering is like what do you use for mulch? Like is it is it uh -huh. like compost or is it leaves like from the fall you collect or uh, most uh, usually it's leaves. For example, I still have uh, quite a lot of um, trees in my garden, mm -hmm. especially it used to be an orchard. So I have apple trees, I have pears in the garden, and they produce lots of leaves and also fallen apples. And I just leave it in the garden. I never um, take it off because it's very, very bad for nature in general. And uh, uh, the trees are actually helping me because they mulched right. my plants. And I do not have to do anything because I see that I have a thick layer of leaves in autumn. And this is just great. Uh, when I do not have enough of, le uh, of leaves, uh, usually I do like that, like this. Um, here, I do not know why, but usually uh, the leaves are taken in parks. Uh, they are taken along the streets uh, and the people working, they are doing large piles of those leaves and then they are taken away. Uh, I just come up with a big, big plastic bags uh, and I'm taking these leaves to my garden. <laughs> so when I've I done that. It, yeah, that's a great idea. I, when I see these piles in my street, that's just happiness because people <laughs> made so much work for me. They prepared already those piles, so I just taking them quickly. And most often I'm using leaves because they are natural and actually do not be afraid because some people say that diseases are living there, pests are living there. Um, well, it's okay. So the nature has some balance. Yes, of course, there are some diseases, some pests, but uh, they won't be destroyed if you just burn your leaves, but you will damage your um, like atmosphere, so everything around you. So it's absolutely natural. The leaves rot, they give the nutrients to your plants. It's very, very natural and very, very good for the garden. And I can't see that I have like many diseases or many pests because I just right. use enormous amounts of leaves. No, it's just very good for my garden. I noticed this. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, so, if somebody orders seed, how long does it usually take for, I mean, I mean, this is an unfair question, really. I know that the challenges that you deal with with collecting seed and your, and because of where you are in Ukraine, it, you know, the power outages and all the various things, the hardships of just conducting business is a challenge. Um, but let's say you, you get an order together. How long does it normally take? To normally once you ship it for it to get to the u.s do you know or does it just vary from shipment to shipment uh it may depend because you can't predict the work of the post office uh, sometimes <laughs> well you we, we won't take all the, those circumstances um uh, which for example we had missile attacks um, uh, recently and they were really severe lots of sure. missile attacks, lots of explosions and uh like our post office doesn't work when uh, there is blackout. Well, it's understandable it because yeah. their system doesn't work. They do not have light and they just can't work. Also, it doesn't work when there is air alert because it's prohibited. They just close down and they do not work. Uh, also, when we have missile attacks, uh, they couldn't work after the missile attacks because their system just laid down. 
and they couldn't accept parcels for several days. So um, I went to the post office, but they couldn't accept parcels. And also uh, here we have lack of post office departments and lack of people working in those departments. And usually there is only one woman working and a huge queue. And not every day you just manage to send out the parcels. For example, like yesterday I didn't manage to send five parcels. I managed to send just one parcel. So it's like we won't speak about all those challenges because they are connected with all those circumstances. Uh, but if we imagine that um, the order came, I packed it quickly. Actually, I packed very quickly. It's not a problem at all. And the same day I came to the post office. So it may take from two weeks to four weeks. Usually. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I, I've never ordered seed internationally. So that's why I was just curious if, you know, it's two weeks, a month, six weeks, I, I had no idea, so. I do not know um, uh, on what it depends. So sometimes the parcels to the USA, they um, come quicker than to the um, European Union countries. I do not know why, because the distance is yeah. very, very, very <laughs> different, but um, very often, like I see that my customers from the, I, I send the parcels uh, during the same day and I see that my customers from the USA, they have already received and they are happy while the European Union countries not at all. So I do not know. It, it depends. So it I understand. Be and maybe four weeks. So I understand. Well, if um, I, I realize that um there's been a lot of interest in your seed. And, and if people hear this episode and go to your shop, they, they might be a little disappointed, but just be patient because um, as the year progresses and new varieties and new inventory, I'm sure you'll list it because, I mean, this has been a great, um, uh, a great way for you to provide for your family there. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's very important way because actually it's our only means here during the war. And yes, I understand that people have to be quite patient because they have to wait for the order. But unfortunately, not everything depends on me. Uh, I'm trying to send out. Of course. Day because actually uh, almost all orders are already packed. But the main problem is to get them sent on our post office and to overcome all those challenges. Sure. Which are not influence at all. This is the main problem because packing is not a problem at all. So I'm just sitting and packing all the days and it's absolutely ugh. And um, also... Mm, um, so yeah, I'm sorry. So uh, here we got uh, some seasonal virus and uh, uh, I was ill for a week and now my husband is also uh, oh, no. ill. Oh, but well, it's a regular thing during winter. There are lots of various seasonal virus. So we're still coughing a little bit. <laughs> oh, so, well, I did not hear that. That's fine. Um, so what an exciting project to work with Erin and her team uh, with Florette on the, on that video, on the, I don't know what you could, the film, it's a film that you, they created um, called, what, what was it? Uh, I've forgotten the name of it now. Oh my gosh. Uh, gardening in the war zone. Yeah. Sorry. The gardening in the war zone. Uh, it is, um, it was, it was amazing. It was really good. How long did it take for you guys to produce that? I mean, that had to be a huge project. Yes, it's a huge project and it took lots of time because we were working um, uh, like just till the uh, date when it go out. Really? So till December, yes. And we started, I think, in the end of August. So just quite a long period of time because um, I need to find out all the materials which I have, all the photographs, all the videos. And also we had to film a lot because I used to film in the Insta format. I have a YouTube channel, but um, I launched it uh, yet before the war. And uh, there are not that many videos, just several videos, but actually they were used in the film. And I, I was really happy to see the moments from my YouTube uh, videos taken uh, before the war. So we filmed uh, 
a lot and it was quite lots of work but it was exciting it was so interesting and my filming skills actually were <laughs> upgraded significantly and it was really interesting to uh, discuss everything with Erin and her team they are extremely helpful they helped in everything that's amazing I didn't know you had a YouTube channel I'm gonna have to go check it out after this um yeah. Yeah, I, I've got a YouTube channel. Also, um, one of the ideas, actually, Erin gave me lots of various um, ideas, very good ideas and um, advice, pieces of advice. Uh, also, I've got a Patreon account, um, Instagram account, Facebook account. Ah, and also one of the most important things, this is my Clematis ebook, but you mentioned. Yes. Yes. My and uh the most important thing that it's being sold from air inside from your floret shop and uh, now it's very very convenient to buy this book because it's extremely quickly the payment is automated and um, uh, the customer gets the ebook uh, immediately so you just pay and got the ebook so you do not need to wait for my confirmation for my sending out uh, etc so it's very very convenient and i'm very grateful to erin for this opportunity yes well i will say i will vouch for the book i have not finished reading the entire book but i have uh, i have read a lot of it and it's very well written the photographs are amazing. The information, if you want to get a deep dive in to Clematis, the book is really full of information. Um, I was really surprised at the detail on seed starting. Um, I didn't realize, you know, there's so many ways of, you know, doing it. Uh, you know, you can do it the fast way and, you know, with, I think it was the gibberellic, I'm going to say I mispronounced that acid or, you know, using those things to help or doing it the slow traditional way. Um, but it gets into detail with all of that. So, um, I highly recommend the book. It's it, again, it's beautiful. Uh, your photography skills really shine through it. Um, I was, I was amazed at the photo photographs in it. Um, crazy uh you are you're very gifted with that and thank you for that um, oh, thank you so much by the way i'm working on the second book actually i have two projects in progress and uh, the first project is um actually one more book about clematis but it will be in the form of clematis passport so there will be the photo of each variety i have in my garden and as i have quite many of them so uh, it should be really interesting and also i will give all the characteristic features of the variety from my own experience because um, i had this idea because i still have many questions and uh, the customers ask me uh, for example they ordered some seeds and they ask me about the height of the mother plants about their habitus uh, about their pruning group etc so lots lots of questions and i had an idea why not do uh, this guide which will be really convenient and you just open the variety you would like to know about everything and you look the main features of this variety and you decide where to plant it in what conditions and what habitats it will have what height etc so it should be really convenient and answer lots of questions that people really have so this is project number one and next project is pennies because pennies is my second love actually my three favorite plants i think <laughs> climatic pennies and snowdrops so uh -huh. i'm not sure whether i'm going to write a book about snowdrops but pennies definitely so i started doing it so and i progress slowly not that quickly but actually the main aim is to make a beautiful and uh, a really very very useful product so this is the main aim and i was very afraid when i was writing about climatis because i'm not a native speaker i was afraid to make mistakes so i read that book i do not know maybe 50 times so i was reading it every time finding mistakes correcting them so it was very very responsible task for me 
and the books I'm working on at the moment are also very, very responsible task for me. Mm. So I'm trying hard. Well, I'm sure they'll be wonderful and I can't wait to see them um, because like I said, this first one was amazing and uh, I'm sure there's, you know, there's so many little uh, nuances with different varieties that I'm sure it'll be helpful because um, you know, from staking or growth habit or like pruning and uh, all these things, you know, they're, they're so different. Well, Allah, we always like to end our podcast with a, with um, a piece of advice and with everything that you've done and everything you're doing and being in Ukraine and the challenges that presents right now, especially, I'm just wondering if there's a piece of advice you'd like to leave our guests. Uh, first of all, I want to say that um, the biggest advice I have, just do not stop doing what you are doing despite the circumstances, because continuing gardening was my best decision ever, despite the war. Uh, it gave me strength to overcome all the circumstances. Actually, well, when I'm in the garden and when I'm doing all those things around my plants, I just forgot for some time about the war, which is going around. And also, uh, it turned out that uh, the garden actually saved my family. It allowed us to survive during the war. And thanks to the gardening, I have all those opportunities. So... I've got all those interviews and I've got photos which you can enjoy because otherwise I just won't have anything to take photos of. And uh, gardening, it's about creating. So when you garden, you mm. create and you create something really beautiful. You create something productive. So keep gardening. And I think that all the persons who have their garden and who adore gardening, they are lucky persons. That's definitely. So just keep doing what you do despite the circumstances and you will be a happy person. Well, coming from you especially, that means so much. And I know for me, it's it's my therapy. It's what's what I enjoy doing. It, you know, that uh, kind of allows me to reset and connect to nature and and seeing what you do is truly inspirational. Thank you, Ala, for being on the Flower Podcast. Oh, thank you so much for this opportunity. I enjoyed this interview a lot, and I send my best wishes to all the uh, viewers of the interview, and I wish them all the best. <laughs>